Here we are, the level six spells, finally. When I rate these spells, I really do have to think about is each spell worth the level six spell slot that we have we get one per long rest but i will say that there are two quarter staves that give you an ability called arcane battery which lets you cast a spell without using a spell slot so perhaps you would use it on your level six spell there is also a necklace that can let you restore a level six spell slot and there is a lithid ability that lets you free cast it's called free cast that lets you cast the spell without using a spell slot i would suggest you're probably going to use those on the level six spells another thing i will be thinking about is do any of the lower level spells do the same thing but better and as with all the other spell lists I will be taking into account concentration if it's required, the damage type, where cold and lightning will be higher. I don't need to think about if anything can be upcast because, well, none of these can be upcast. This is just my opinion, my thoughts. Please let me know your thoughts, explain to me why I'm wrong, and do give extra information if there's anything missing. And that's been really, really useful and really, really helpful. And I've been really glad at all the comments I've had where you've been like, Oi, CVG, you missed this bit about this spell. And that's awesome. Thank you very much. As always, I will be going in alphabetical order, starting with Arcane Gate. This is available to sorcerers, warlocks, and wizards. So the fists have been spared for this particular spell. It does require concentration. Create two linked teleportation portals for 10 turns, and the range is 60 feet. So you can pick two places, one over here, let's say, and let's say one over there. And then you can walk through one Arcane Gate and get to the other. Since the range is 60 feet, I guess you could get two portals 120 feet away from each other at opposite ends of the range. So where can this be useful? Now I'm here for a reason. You can actually get to different places. Let's go to tactical view. Press O if you didn't know. And let's put one up there. And you can get to places perhaps you hadn't been able to get to before. Now you might be able to use this during a fight if you want to run away, I suppose. Or maybe you want to lure one or two people up to where you are and then drop concentration so it takes time for everyone else to catch up to you. One annoying thing is there's no indication once you've actually clicked once. So I just clicked where the first portal's going to be. Uh, there's no way to know if I've clicked it, if I've made a mistake. Perhaps I don't want it there. There we are. Two more portals. I'm going to stick this in C tier. One is concentration. And secondly, there are other spells to get you around. Now, the good thing about Arcane Gate is you don't need to like, cast on anyone. So what I mean by that is, sure, Misty Step can pretty much do the same thing, except every character has to cast Misty Step. This obviously does last for longer. It can be good for exploring. But as I said at the beginning of the video, this is a level six spell slot we're talking about. What I would like to have is if we can put it in places we can't see. During combat, I want to be using these other spells. Outside of combat, I might use other things to get my party around. Another example could be the Arrow of Transposition. So a star in our cleric here. Summon a wall of razor sharp blades that turns the area into difficult terrain and damages anyone foolish enough to come close. So it does require concentration. 6d10 slashing damage. That's quite a lot. So a bit like some of these other area spells we've seen. You click one place and you can see where the wall of thorn, wall of thorns, where the blade barrier is going to come up. Perhaps I want to do it that way. It's slightly narrow. There are some wider area effect spells. Assaulting someone. So you do damage when it goes down. Now I want to keep a star in safe. So maybe here's one use of arcane gates, right? Put one there, one there. Now that was a level six spell slot though. Get him to run away. Oh no, 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 no. Da Phew. Damn. Okay, Starion knows exactly what he's doing. Witnessed assaulting someone. Let's try and not show off arcane gate. Let's just run away. So the beginning of their turn, if they're in the blade, they take a chunk of damage. I'll wait to see what these two do as well. So they might try and jump through it. No, no, oh, gone. Ah, she's not gonna. Oh, there we are. And it slows them down. Now I feel like hopefully I've learned when I put Wall of Fire a bit too low in that tier level four tier list. I think for clerics, this probably is an S tier spell. I really used this myself in my first playthrough in the House of Grief. It's quite a difficult fight in there, a lot of enemies. It slows them down. They don't seem to completely avoid it. I've seen them jumping through it. And there's loads of damage when you when you put it down and when they walk through it. Really, really good. Gain Lightning is next. So this is available to sorcerers and wizards. Strike an enemy with lightning. Three more bolts will leap from the target, electrifying as many as three other enemies within 60 feet. It's a dexterity saving throw. If they fail, they take the full damage. If they pass, they take half damage. It's guaranteed. Now, I want to show you something to show you how awesome this spell is. It's lightning damage. So if enemies are wet, they're going to take double damage. So I'm actually going to... 
Awesome. And we can twin chain lightning. Give me one and two. Oh. <laughs> Deleted. Awesome. And I've got Will here in his nice sexy outfit. A uh, straight up test tip. It's party safe. Uh, yeah, and it's lightning damage. We can double it. It's guaranteed damage. Even if they pass a dexterity saving throw, you still get some damage done, which can still be doubled. The meta magics are great with it. It's just my go-to damaging spell. If I want to target more than one enemy, and I've got a source for it or wizard, chain lightning is my go-to spell. And now we have Circle of Death. This is available to sorcerers, warlocks, and wizards. Sculpt a massive sphere of entropic energy around a creature. Devastate the target and all surrounding creatures. So the targets make a constitution saving throw. This does affect allies. So you can see if I target Tavkazax here, everyone around is highlighted. I can just about target the fist at the back and it gets all of them. The area of effect is very, very large. The downsides to the spell are a few, several, I think. One, you do have to target an enemy. I can't just put it down in the middle of nowhere. Two, it is necrotic damage. Now, there aren't as many undead who are resistant or maybe immune to necrotic damage in Act 3. I say Act 3 because we have to be level 11 before we get our level 6 spells. And I would suggest that most people will be in Act 3 when they get these. And lastly, the damage done is kind of only 8d6. That's the same as Fireball. I can actually get these fists because I can target anywhere I want. And if I cast it at level 6, I can do 11d6 damage. I don't like Circle of Death very much. The area, it's like a double-edged sword. The area is too big. You've really got to keep your allies clear. And there might be some perhaps neutral NPCs around. Now, I will say, because someone's going to definitely talk about it, there is an item, they've talked about it with all the ne necromancy spells. The Staff of Cherished Necromancy, which you get in Act 3 in Baldur's Gate. If you kill a creature with a spell, you get Life Essence, which means you can cast a Necromancy spell for free. So you could cast Circle of Death over and over and over again, at which point for one particular item, perhaps it's S tier because then there's basically no cost to it. But aside from that, I think the drawbacks are a bit too many for me. And Sorcerers and Warlocks get Chain Lightning, which we can double the damage of and only hit enemies. Not as many perhaps, but when we have Chain Lightning in the same spell level, I feel like it's just not quite good enough. I realise I didn't show it to you. Let's at least show it to you once, see? assaulting someone. Next up is Create Dead, available to clerics, warlocks and wizards. Now you might find yourself with some bodies lying in the street for no known reason, and you might find yourself with a level 6 spell slot and create undead. So, target a corpse, and we get ourselves our own little mummy. What can mummies do? Well they got a rotting fist. I wish I had basket to tell us it's fisting time. You can attack an enemy, you do 2d6 plus 3, plus 3d6 necrotic damage, and maximum hit points reduced by 8. Awesome. You can try and use your dreadful glare. Now, unfortunately, it's only a single target. You can do it once per turn, though. Ah, they saved. If an enemy is frightened, you can then use your multi-attack, which is a huge amount of damage. Well, we can see here that the total damage is 16 to 66. Far more than enough to... Oops, that's dash. Far more than enough to take out a refugee. Man. <laughs> refugee running away from war just staring down a mummy in the face like eh not scared of you right, what about you maybe it's too close to Halloween I don't really think it's a real mummy one of the problems though is that the DC is only 11 so inside combat where there are enemies that are much stronger than a refugee uh, the chance of that working is probably quite low. Anyway, I'm going to come back to here so I can I can ignore the flaming fist that come along. It's another necromancy spell, so if you're going to use the Staff of Cherished Necromancy, you can cast this for free. Still, it's a summon. 93 hit points is great. Mummies are vulnerable to fire damage, though. Keep that in mind. The Dreadful Glare probably won't work so well, but, but the Rotting Fist is pretty good. I would suggest that upcasting Animate Dead might be a better choice at level 6, because then you actually get a whole flock or pack of ghouls, three flying ghouls or three normal ghouls, perhaps it might be more useful. Each of those ghouls are considerably weaker than the mummy. So maybe down to A tier. Ooh, it's hard to say. Yeah, I'm going to leave it down in A tier for, for those two reasons, actually. Sorry, going to go back on what I just said. The fact we can't upcast Animate Dead and the Dreadful Glare is not going to work very well in combat. And now we have Disintegrate. Available to sorcerers and wizards. So what does it do? You point your finger at someone, they make a dexterity saving throw. If they fail, they take 10d6 plus 40 damage, 50 to 100 damage. If they pass, they take no damage. 
Right, you can see a pile of ash because I accidentally wasn't recording when I used this last time. All right. Oof. Gone. That looks awesome. However, my level five spell, curriculum of strategy, artistry of war, can do the same thing. And if I wanted to, I could target more than one enemy. There's no dexterity saving through. The damage for curriculum of strategy, artistry of war isn't 18 to 78. This is still a bug to tool tip. There are six lots of 8 to 18, which actually means the total damage here is 48 to 108. Very, very similar to the 50 to 100 for Disintegrate. And there's no way the enemy can pass a saving throw for that, for Curriculum of Strategy, Artistry of War. But Disintegrate, if they pass a saving throw, nothing happens. Now, I desperately want to love the spell. It looks awesome. And if an enemy does get turned to Ash, actually, you can still get all of their items. The items don't turn into Ash or Dust. I just have to put it down here because there are so many better spells that are cast. I can cast Curriculum of Strategy, Artistry of War, or if I really want to do damage to a single target, up cast a level 6 Witch Bolt to an enemy that's wet, and you will do more damage than Disintegrate, and there's no way that they can pass a saving throw. And by the time we get to the higher levels, we can have things like Bless, we can have Advantage to make sure the attack roll for Witch Bolt does actually work. But as a single target damaging spell for level 6 spell slot, Disintegrate doesn't actually do it for me. A bite is our next spell. This is available to Bards, Sorcerers, Warlocks, and Wizards. So you get three options when you cast it. It does require concentration. It's a wisdom saving throw. So I can choose to put a creature to sleep, make them frightened, which should make sure they can't move and their attacks have disadvantage, or afflict them so they have disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks. Let's go for sleep, let's say. Gone to sleep for 10 turns. People can wake them up with a shove, which will probably happen here. So perhaps sleep wasn't the best use here. Just try and stop them. Yeah. So we'll see on the next turn while they're all doing nothing. And the bard can now recast one of these without using a spell slot. But we do require concentration. I don't think this is actually going to work on the Steel Watcher. I'm fairly sure they're immune to Frightened. Yeah. <laughs> don't really know why I let me cast that. But it takes my action. So for the most part, this isn't that great because if we want to have some sort of crowd control, we've got some level force, but we've got some lower level spells. We've got hold person, hold monster, polymorph, banishment, one of those. But the fact it's got sleep, it is quite nice. But I will also say that if we want to use the sleep option, we still have glyph of warding, which does the same thing. And this uses your action to put a single enemy, to inflict this debuff on a single enemy. And lots of fights have lots of enemies. Now you can use this to put some bosses to sleep though, because of that, because it, I think it does have a use. I'm going to leave it at C tier, but it's almost down in D for me, just because of the concentration requirement and the fact we can only affect a single enemy each round because it takes an action. Of course, we could be hasted, I suppose, and do, to, do it to two enemies, but then we can cast two spells with those actions. Not level six spells, but we could cast two spells. Flesh to Stone is next, which is available to Wizards and Warlocks, and it does what it says on the tin it will turn someone's flesh into stone, but it's not as simple as point and click. The enemy has to fail four constitution saving throws in a row. Let's see this. Now you can cast this on a neutral NPC and they won't say anything. I'm actually going to try and increase the chances here because I don't think this will work well if it's only a 75% chance. So that was a potion of arcane power, battle mage. What was actually making the name up? That was a potion of battle mage's power which increases my spell save DC by three. So, where's it gone? Here we are, flesh to stone. A 90% chance, that's pretty good. Is there better? Ah, 95%, all right, even better. So, restrained stage one. At the end of the turn, I'll make another constitution saving throw. And it goes to restrained stage two. We'll watch it happen in real time. Stage three, and finally, talking your way out of this they have turned to stone now when i tested this even if i kill all of these enemies here i'm still going to be stuck in combat i guess i could run away and then yeah like literally flee combat but this counts as an enemy in the combat they are petrified they turn to stone they can't hurt you that was the best case scenario so i've just reloaded just to show you what happens let's see who's on some 75 percent hopefully this all right so failed we're looking good Say so failed. Say so failed. I actually want to show you what happens if they pass a saving throw. 
witnessed Ooh. assaulting someone. I just want to point out the chances of it working is your percentage to the power of four. So with a 75% chance of the enemy failing, if you do 0.75 to the power of four, that tells you the chance of it actually working over the course of four turns. And so they say make a single save and that's it. They're not turned to stone. Uh, just because they have to fail four constitution saving throws in a row and it requires concentration. And in combat, most combats are over within four rounds, I would suggest. I would say just not worth it. You might be able to turn a boss into stone. Sure. And then wail away on the boss. Fine. I'd probably rather do it more quickly because when someone is turned to stone, when they are petrified, they are going to be resistant to pretty much all damage. Next up is Globe of Invulnerability. This is available to wizards and sorcerers. So what does it do? You create a barrier that makes creatures and objects inside it immune to all damage. You can just about see the outline. If you are a sorcerer, you could actually extend this. It only lasts for three turns. It does require concentration. You are immune to all damage, but you're not immune to status conditions. So if the Steel Watcher comes inside here, and then hits us with the sword and knocks Lazar prone, she will lose concentration. So let's see it in action first. No, oh, it's just using unarmed strike, how kind. Wait, no, I don't need to do that. What am I talking about? All right, invulnerable, no damage taken. Enemies will also be invulnerable while inside the globe. So you do want to try and kind of push them out, keep them out. So they're all gonna come in, try and inflict conditions on us, try and hurt us. But nothing's going to happen. Unless they're not us prone. So can still be bleeding, which does give disadvantage on constitution saving throws. So it's not quite the be-all and end-all of winning a combat, but for the most part it is, I would say. I did ask my viewers on Discord if you got any tips and tricks for the level 6 spells. One that came up is if you put Guardian of Faith just within the globe, on the edge of it. It becomes invulnerable. Now, why is this important? This is important because when the Guardian of Faith deals damage, it deals damage to itself. But if it's invulnerable, it doesn't take that damage to itself. It can still deal it out. The person who sent this trick wanted to remain anonymous, so I'm not going to say their name. And so thank you very much to them. Now, to try and show off this thing with Guardian of Faith, I'm actually going to recast this. Great. Two globes of invulnerability. No, let's take hers down. Oh, my bard needs to get inside. He's maimed, so I need to heal myself. Now, let's see this, right? It takes... Uh, that's what I wanted to show you. Guardian of Faith didn't lose hit points, so we're going to hit for 20 more damage later. So we see it here again. And it will keep on going. Being out damage every time an enemy within its range attacks one of the party members. Anyway, straight up to S tier, you can really, really save you in a difficult fight. I myself, and I've seen other people say they've used it in the fight. In the House of Hope, for example, just any difficult fight, you can stick this up and you're almost guaranteed to be safe for a few turns. Get rid of as many enemies as you can and then walk out and you'll be absolutely fine. Arm is next, only available to clerics. So you target a single enemy, they take a, or make a constitution saving throw. If they fail, the hit point maximum is reduced by the damage dice that are rolled. Never goes below one, so can't kill someone with it. If they pass a saving throw, they still take half the damage, but maximum hit points are not reduced. So 50% chance, flip of a coin. Saved. Right, bit sad. Did 25 damage. That's not that much. It would have done 50 damage to a single target. And in fact, instead of being 50 damage, this would actually go down to 15 hit points in total. Slightly ambivalent about this, as far as I can tell, it's, it's the Cleric's only single target level 6 spell. But if if I want to do damage, I'd probably want to do your use Blade Barrier because this is necrotic damage. And Blade Barrier can do damage to more than one person and over multiple turns. I guess there's a small benefit to reducing the hit point maximum in that they can't heal themselves above the new hit point maximum. Uh, maybe they can be put to sleep, level 1 sleep spell. So I can kind of see it has its uses, but for Clerics, I'd probably want to use yeah some of these other spells for the level 6 spell slot. And next up is heal. This is available to clerics and druids this time. And we have here our classic druid will heal. Heal the target's wounds and remove blindness from any diseases. To 70 healing. Just 70. Now no one's hurt. Now I've made everyone pretty much here a spellcaster. So we can see 70 hit points. 
is healing up most of the maximum hit points of these characters. However, these are casters mostly with not the highest number of hit points. As with the other healing spells, healing during combat is generally not that great. However, this is one time where the healing done is very good, at least compared to the other healing options we get. So even a level six heal wounds, there's 68 plus your spell casting ability modifier of healing. The average isn't going to be that good. This also does cure blindness and diseases. But during combat, I wouldn't use it. Outside of combat, I would probably just take a short rest or a long rest. As an emergency, yes, fine. I can see that during combat. But outside of combat, there's just no need for this. Generally, I, I say this, I feel like I say this every time with the um with healing spells. Generally, it will be it will be better to kill some enemies, such as with Blade Barrier, healing one of your allies preemptively or up from being downed. If they're downed, please use healing word or mass healing word. Or throw a potion at them. You can throw some very high level potions as well by the time we get heal. And next up is Hero's Feast, also available to clerics and druids. This spell's got quite a bit going on. You and everyone around can't be poisoned, diseased, or frightened. Cool. Your hit point increases. Hit points increase. Okay, it doesn't tell you by what. And you make wisdom saving throws with advantage. What it doesn't tell you, you also do produce some camp supplies. Now, before I do that, I should just get some... Get some summons out. Now, why am I doing this? Well... When I cast Hero's Feast, it affects all allies within range. Thoroughly stuffed. And what it doesn't tell you, here it is, the feast supplies. Usually for me, it has contained a bottle of water. Always nice to have. The camp supplies given would be fine for Explorer and Standard mode difficulties. For Tactician, it doesn't give you the 80. But by the time we're in Act 3, the camp supplies are not a problem. So we can see here we get 12 extra hit points from being thoroughly stuffed. That alone is great. Oh, and also it does stack with aid. So level 6 aid. And look at that. Even Scratch has 42 hit points. You can get, like, camp cast this. You can get some ally or hireling to cast these and kick them out your group afterwards. And there is an even extra bonus to all of this i need to prepare a certain spell now this is thanks to jib and fade if you haven't checked out his channel please do in fact let's just come in here so cloud kill pretty cool spell lovely airy affects your allies so you're like oh no i don't always want to use it but witnessed assaulting someone we are immune to poison damage so we can just walk inside the cloud kill and have all the enemies come to us Anyway, easy S tier. Doesn't require concentration, gives you a whole bunch of buffs, affects all of the allies within range, stacks with aid. I find myself casting this at the beginning of the day quite often and just replenishing the spell slot using the necklace that there is. Next is Otterluke's Freezing Sphere. This is only available to wizards. Here we are, you create a sphere that does 10d6 cold damage. There are two choices. You can either just throw it and lob it, and you'll do damage to these enemies. They do get to make a constitution saving throw. If they pass, they only take half the damage. And it will also create ice, which is good for knocking people prone, especially wizards who are concentrating. The other option is you create an item that after 10 turns will explode to do the same amount of damage. So you can, as it says, you can put it in your pocket, give it to an ally or throw it away. The area is it's pretty decent, I would say. It's an evocation spell. So if you're an evocation wizard, you won't affect allies. Otherwise, you will. It is cold damage, so it can be doubled if we make enemies wet. So let's show that. And throw it at them. Boom! Lovely amount of damage. So I do want to show you what you can do with the portable sphere. So create it. Explosion imminent, right? It's what you can do. Let's go to pickpocket someone, except reverse pickpocket them. There you are. Let's try and get out of range and then we'll wait. Boom! Oh. Now, interestingly, it didn't start combat this time. It does create a nice surface also. <laughs> she fell over again. Comedic timing, I feel. I'm gonna stick it in A tier. Uh, what I don't like about it is it does affect allies, so you do have to keep clear. But what I do like is that it's cold damage, which can be doubled. We've got the option of turning it into an item, which we can give to other people. And it does have an area of effect that's pretty good. It doesn't do quite as much damage as Chain Lightning, however. 
again, the damage is fairly decent. I feel like on an evocation wizard, this would be higher. S tier, because it doesn't affect allies. Because the area is so large, you have to make sure everyone's out of the way. And then we have Otto's Irresistible Dance. This is available to bards and wizards. There we are, Otto's Irresistible Dance. I do want to point out, this video is being recorded in patch 4. Before patch 4, there was a bug where if you cast Otto's Irresistible Dance, there was no save against it at all whatsoever, and enemies would be... Well, let's show you. There we are. One thing I do want to point out, so when you first cast it, it is a 100% chance to hit. There's no save against it. Everyone will have advantage on attack rolls against them. So if I was to cast Firebolt, there we are, Otto's Irresistible Dance. But on subsequent turns, the enemy will get to make a Wisdom saving throw. It does require concentration. So, you know, this is fighting with other control spells and it only affects a single enemy. I'm going to leave it in B for the fact that the first casting of it has a 100% chance to hit. Now, I guess we could make the argument that if you had a very high spell save DC, then that doesn't matter too much. But it is competing against hold person. Like, honestly here, hold person would win out, right? I can cast it. I mean, no, up casting to level six, I can target five enemies. I've only got four enemies available at the moment, so even level five. One, two, three, four. And honestly, hold person... If it lands, it's better than Otto's Irresistible Dance, I would say. Attacks from within 10 feet are critical hits automatically and so on, whereas Otto's Irresistible Dance, you only have advantage. Enemies do have disadvantage on dexterity saving throws with Otto's Irresistible Dance, which is a nice little benefit. But when it's competing against other concentration control spells, I don't think it's any higher than A. Before patch 4, this is basically S tier because it takes out an enemy, guaranteed, with no saves against it. But now it can be saved against in subsequent turns. Next up is Planar Ally. This is only available to clerics. Although if you watch my level 5 video, you will know that there is a way to get the Diva as a level 5 spell for wizards. There is an item that gives Planar Ally Cambion, which is the Infernal Rapier, given to you if you save a certain NPC towards the end of Act 2. So here's the Cambion. Now I've already shown the Diva in a previous video, so let's get up the Ginny. So the Ginny here. Was it Jin? Yeah, Ginny. As a scimitar, just an extra 2d10 poisoning damage. That's all right. Does have kind of a breath weapon, which can do 48 poison damage if they fail a constitution saving throw. And it can make enemies drunk, which is kind of cool. Gives disadvantage on dexterity saving throws. Can effectively misty step around. And also restrain enemies. Let's see if we can do that. Ah, they all saved against it. I wonder what the saving throw is. 15, that's actually okay. Compared to the mummy, which was 11. Someone. 15 isn't the best, but it's workable. The Cambion can shoot out rays of fire, a bit like Scorching Ray, but it's 3d6 fire damage per ray instead of 2d6, which is pretty cool. Can charm people, but the rates of success on this are usually low because the spell save DC is low. And if someone is charmed, they can then go and use Draining Kiss. I've actually rarely got this to work. The charm just has such a low percentage chance to work. Let's uh, just show that. While we're waiting, we get an extra summon. They're quite strong. They've got a decent number of hit points, especially the Ginny here. 161 hit points. That's way more than most characters, I would say. So this fiendish charm only works on humanoids. 60%, 60%, and then... Oh, 20%. It's a wisdom saving throw. And then the thing is, that's this action done. The next turn, you can use this. 10 to 55 damage. I'd probably rather just cast Razor Fire twice and get about the same amount of damage done. Now, being re restrained is awesome because we get advantage on attack rolls. And then let's just show Drunken in here. Can we get closer? Oh, I just killed someone. Anyway, up into S tier. It's awesome. The summons are strong and we get a choice of three different summons. Next, we have Sunbeam. This is available to druids, sorcerers, and wizards. This spell does require concentration. Enemies make a constitution saving throw. We do 68 damage. If they pass, they take half the damage. And it's a beam, like a sunbeam, coming out a bit like lightning bolt. It does affect allies, although it is an evocation spell. So if you're an evocation wizard, obviously that doesn't have to worry you. If they fail the saving throw, they're also blinded, which is pretty cool. On the next turn, if I still have concentration, I can then recast it without using a spell slot. So it's radiant damage, but by the time we're in Act 3, that's not as important. Now, there are items that give a 
debuff to enemies, radiating orb, if you deal radiant damage. So that does work quite nicely with this spell. But unfortunately, it suffers from concentration and the damage done isn't really amazing. 68 is okay. If it lasts 10 turns, then yeah, sure, you can do loads of damage. But what could I have done instead? I could have cast... Oh, I don't have it here. Does anyone have Lightning Bolt? I don't know if they do. No. Ah, we do. Perhaps I could have had Lightning Bolt, which is 8d6 damage instead of 68. And Lightning Bolt's damage can be doubled, and it's only a level 3 spell slot. Now, obviously, it doesn't blind enemies. Blinding enemies is awesome. So for me, because I've got other damaging spells that affect a larger area, Sorcerers and Wizards have access to Chain Lightning. For Druids, it's probably a bit better. They don't get very many damaging spells. So I'm going to leave it at B because it's not just damage. It does give a debuff, potentially. We can recast it again and again, but the concentration just really hurts it because then I can't use, for example, Globe of Invulnerability here. We've got the last three W spells next. WWW. Wall of Ice is first. This is available to, well, only Wizards. So it's another Wall spell. It's a bit wider than Blade Barrier. So I can cast it. Perhaps I should get a bit closer. I say that and then I'm probably going to lose concentration. But there we are. Come on. Target is blocked. Ah, it doesn't like changes in height very much. Right, there we are. So, creates ice, first of all. Oh, and the, the Steel Watch is standing on top of it. Now, slightly annoyingly, it, this is a bit inconsistent, I find, because it does say it deals 10d6 cold damage to anyone standing in the way, but these people were standing in the way and didn't receive that damage. Now, interestingly, it does also say when the ice is broken, it leaves behind a cloud of frigid air that deals 10d6 cold damage. Now, it's cold damage, so as always, we can double that damage if enemies are wet. Or allies, I suppose, if you want to get your allies wet. So I'm going to try and destroy this pillar here. No, mm, this pillar here beneath the Steel Watcher. So it should fall into the uh, frigid air, hopefully. The area of the air inside is the frigid air, I think, is very narrow. So we did some damage to the Steel Watcher. It's in the icy cloud. That's the name of the surface, right? Let's just see. Uh, Laser, I'll get you out of here. Maintain concentration. It is a concentration spell. So don't take damage if they start their turn inside the Icy Cloud, which is pretty unfortunate, really. So we're going to wait for their other Fist's turns. So it didn't go into the Icy Cloud. Oof. This one won't either, obviously. Four Tavgazaks here. Whoa, we don't want that happening. I'm kind of disappointed by the spell because the damage just doesn't seem to work as often as the spell describes that it should do and it's concentration it's a wizard only spell and they don't get a lot of concentration spells perhaps in this in this spell level but they do have lots of concentration spells in general but it is cold damage so if we can get it to work that's good we can use it to cut people off but we may as well just use wall of stone for that level five spell instead and if we want to do an area of effect damage we've got otter Luke's freezing sphere or chain lightning for that on the wizard anyway wall of thorns yet another kind of wall spell this is for druids only so wheel the druid here Showing off the W spell. It's got a fair bit going on. So we create a wall of thorns. <laughs> uh, and surrounded by entangling vines. This is pretty good. And creatures can move through the wall. But they take 78 piercing damage. Awesome. And the movement speed is quartered. That's pretty strong. So I'm going to put this more, slightly more horizontally now. To try and force the enemies to come through it. Now that's pretty cool. So some of them. Let's have a look here. So some of them failed their saving throw. Now, slightly oddly, it says DC 3 here. Here it says DC 12, which is quite low, a bit annoying. It also says DC 12. DC 3 when they succeed, who knows. The ones that pass the saving throw still receive the damage, but it's only in the very center to the enemies receive the damage. Around the outside of the entangling vines, which are the ones that can, well, entangle enemies. We can see Fist's Silena here is entangled because she's inside the vines. These vines down here can be burnt away using fire damage. I would avoid using fire damage in this sort of fight. So don't use fireball or wall of fire. So even if they jump through it, they still have to make a saving throw. So DC there is three. It's annoying. Still, they took half the damage of the half resistant, which is why it went down to seven. But 78 is pretty good damage. So let's see them... And you only get damage inside the main thorns on the inside. What are you going to do, eh? Yep. 
still receive 20 damage, even though they pass their saving throw. Now, the enemy has been quite clever to jump over the vines, most mostly. Don't know why this dude didn't. Now, this is a concentration spell. It does seem to be bugged with a DC of 3. If it wasn't such, if it wasn't a bugged DC, I'd put it at S tier. As of recording, it's bugged. I do think it's very useful. It's like Blade Barrier, for example. Plus, it's got the added benefit of quartering an enemy, the enemy's movement speed and also potentially entangling enemies, which gives you advantage on attacks against them and so on. But purely because of the bug, I'm going to leave it down in A. And lastly, we have Windwalk. This is also only available to Druids, ending on a Druid note here. And we've got our famous Druid wheel once again. So what does it do? All allies get the gaseous form condition. Let's show you. Interestingly, it doesn't require concentration, so you can stay like this as long as you want. Each person has control over their own gaseous form. So we can, I was up here earlier, fly up to here if we want to. Good stuff, eh? And everyone's going to be able to follow. Now, one good thing about gaseous form is you can go into the tiny little like pipes and things. You wouldn't might not be able to if you were your normal size. You can go through bars. We can fly around, float around. It's pretty cool. The only real downside is it's a level 6 spell. So we've got to use a level 6 spell slot to do this. It's very good for getting around Baldur's Gate itself. Who cares about paths when you can just fly around? Can I fly up here? Yes, I can. Look at this. So this is very good for exploring. I'm going to be a bit kind. I've been unkind to utility spells in the past. I'm going to put it up at B tier. Tiny bit like with Arcane Gate. There are other things that do this. There is the level 3 spell gaseous form itself that only affects one person at a time though. But if you're going on a big exploring binge, gaseous form is amazing for that actually. The main downside to gaseous form is you can't do anything else apart from move around. We can deal one damage, so don't get into combat. It's not a good idea. You are resistant to all damage, but I mean, probably shouldn't be getting into combat anyways. So I wouldn't say there's a massive bonus. But yeah, I'll leave it at B. So... That's my opinion. I'm just a filthy casual anyway. You let me know why I'm wrong. I do find that with the level 6 spells, there are a few just top hitters right up here. And it's really difficult to justify using some of these low, lower ones most of the time. But they do have their uses. Just disintegrate and flesh to stone just really, really don't do it for me. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you to the members of my channel. This isn't the end of my tier lists. It is the end of the mainstream spell lists though. And please remember to download Raid Shadow Legends and by using the link or QR code, you'll get a huge head start in the game.